Thank you so much, Diane. I'll just press continue there. It's such a pleasure to join you this Wednesday morning. And I really hope that this presentation imparts some practical, simple nutrition tips that will empower you guys to live a healthy, better quality of life. And I think ultimately that's what we all want is to improve our quality of life. So I remember I was attending a dietitian presentation and this dietitian said to her audience that she constantly was asked by her patients, what is the best diet out there? And I was an intern at the time, and I was intrigued with her answer. I was just sort of waiting with bated breath to hear what she had to say. And she said, which I thought was so uh, important, she said, eat as close to the farm as possible. So essentially really try and minimize your intake of processed foods, refined foods, eat wholesome foods as much as possible. And that really resonated with me. Now, over the course of 16 years being a dietitian, I still believe that is 100% true if we can eat as close to the far farm as possible. But we also know there is so much research emerging um, about the Mediterranean diet and some of the components of the Mediterranean diet that I think is a nice way to present an alternative form of a meal pattern that is also conducive for health too. So we're going to delve into the Mediterranean diet and we're going to talk about how it lends itself to a better quality of life and also to longevity. All right, so our discussion points this morning include, what is the role of nutrition and aging? Let's, we're gonna delve into the Mediterranean diet for health and also longevity. We'll talk about the Mediterranean scorecard and those of you who are participating in this session, hopefully got an email with some handouts that included that. We're going to go through the heart and stroke meal plan toolkit. And then at the end, we're gonna discuss some action items and hopefully have some time for a question and answer period. All right, so nutrition and longevity. So when we look at our longevity, we all wanna live longer, right? We all wanna have a good quality of life. Everything points to having a diet that decreases inflammation when it comes to longevity. We know that having more inflammation in our body will lead to chronic disease and the worsening of chronic conditions. So how can we decrease inflammation? That really is the key. So first, we're going to talk about some key points. We're going to talk about a balanced diet. So what does that look like? We also know there's a lot of information coming from hot zones or hot spots in the world known as blue zones. Have any of you guys heard of that before, the blue zones? Uh, Dan Butner, he's a researcher, and he has spent uh, an extensive amount of time studying these places around the world. So the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, Loma Linda, California, uh, Okinawa, Japan. And we're going to talk about Okinawa, Japan. And so these places, and there's more, these places have known to have individuals living well into their hundreds. So we want to know what are their secrets? So we're going to spend some time talking about Okinawa, Japan. Drinking enough water. Why is that important? Also going nutty with nuts. Why are nuts an important part of our nutrition and maybe longevity? And then we're gonna delve into that Mediterranean diet. So first of all, let's talk about eating a balanced diet. And it does not have to be complicated. It really doesn't. Sometimes I think we make nutrition really complex and that's not necessarily our fault because I mean, we go onto the internet and everything is just, you know, finger strokes away in terms of finding out information about nutrition. Not only that, you know, your neighbor might come up to you and say, Hey, I've been on keto or I've done this or intermittent fasting. It's so easy to get confused about nutrition to figure out what is the best for you and also what works with so much information just readily available. 
And I mean, we're all kind of experts on nutrition, right? Because we all eat, right? Well, not necessarily, not necessarily. I think, again, the best approach to nutrition is keeping it simple, just with the balance plate approach. So when we think about the balance plate approach, we want to visualize that plate and we want to make 50% of that plate fruits and vegetables as much as possible. So again, at the beginning of the presentation, I said one of the number one things that will contribute to early death and um, chronic disease and the perpetuation of a chronic condition or worsening of that chronic condition is inflammation. When we have more fruits and vegetables within our diet, that is actually going to give us more exposure to antioxidants, vitamin A, vitamin C, and all of those antioxidants will lessen inflammation in our body. Now, when we're thinking about those fruits and vegetables, we really want those bright colored fruits, those dark green vegetables. There's even information about, you know, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli. Um, broccoli contains a chemical known as sulforaphane, which lends itself to lessening inflammation. We even know cooked tomatoes, for example, will have a component known as lycopene that can actually help with the prevention of prostate cancer. Um, I work with a lot of athletes and we know vitamin C that are present in fruits and vegetables will also help with the absorption of iron. So when we have fruits and vegetables on our plate, there's synergy with some of the other nutrients on our plate too. We're going to absorb more iron with that vitamin C. We're also going to get, like I mentioned, more exposure to those antioxidants that's going to decrease inflammation. So it doesn't have to be complicated. I want you guys to just look at your fists right now and ask yourself this question, you know, at my lunch and supper, am I getting at least one fist of vegetables and am I getting maybe a serving of fruit at that meal? And if you're not, that's maybe an opportunity for you to have a fruit as a snack or maybe vegetables as a snack later on. All right. So we're talking about our hands for portions. Look at your palm with me. So your palm really is going to be that portion of lean protein and the thickness of your palm as well. So when we go out to a restaurant, you're going to be hard pressed to find a portion of protein that is about the size of your palm. We traditionally in North America, eat, North America consume much larger portions of protein and much larger portions of our grains and carbohydrate on our plate. And we don't consume enough of those fruits and vegetables. So again, using your palm, look at your palm and say, okay, am I getting at least this much protein at my meal? Am I taking in more? Or am I taking in less? Now, especially as we get older, we want to make sure that we're, we are taking in enough protein because we start to lose muscle mass at around the age of 40. And we really want to maintain muscle mass by exposing our body to protein on an ongoing basis. So at our three core meals, our breakfast, lunch, and supper, we definitely need to have protein present. And I would also argue at our snacks as well. So when we're thinking about that lean protein, it could be beans. It could be tofu. I know some of you guys might be like, ooh, tofu. There's some really great recipes out there for tofu if any of you guys are interested. Uh, it could be chicken. It could be turkey. It could be fish. And it could even be small amounts of red meat. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. So if we take our fist, just one fist again, we want at least one fist or so of that carbohydrate, those healthy grains and starches. Now, I know many of you guys have probably been ingrained with the messaging of, okay, if I want to lose weight, I got to get rid of my carbohydrate, right? But when we get rid of our grains and, and our starches, we're losing a big chunk of fiber. Now, why is fiber important, especially as we age? Our colon, our bowels might become more sluggish, which can lend itself to constipation. And that is very uncomfortable, as many of you guys know. So we want to keep that waste moving along. Another thing about fiber is we know so much about probiotics. I mean, how many of you guys have heard about probiotics? But have you guys heard about a prebiotic? So fiber 
is a prebiotic. It actually provides food for the existing microbiota or that bacteria in our gut. And we're learning so much about the gut and that microbiome and how if we don't have a healthy gut, that can actually lead to inflammation. So those grains and starches are important too. We wanna choose water or milk or a milk alternative with our meals. So again, notice I didn't necessarily put juice um, because if we're having our fruits, we're going to get, be getting that natural sugar from our fruits. And we're also going to be getting the fiber from our fruits as well. So water or milk or a milk alternative, which will provide us with some calcium and protein at that meal is preferable. And then don't forget those healthy fats. So as you can see, as I'm describing this balancing plate, it's like a layering process, right? We're layering nutrient upon nutrient. So fat is so important because it helps us absorb all those fat soluble vitamins. Fat also keeps us warm during the winter. And you know what? I know many of you guys, again, this is the conditioning that we've learned and, and some of the messaging that we've learned over the years that fat is bad. But as we get older, it's actually important to have a little bit of cushioning. If you get sick and you end up in the hospital, it's imperative that you have some cushioning on your body to act as an energy reserve. My father was diagnosed with cancer in uh, December about a year and a half, two years ago almost. And, you know, he lost such a significant amount of weight and he wasn't very big to begin with. So again, as we get older, it's actually advantageous to have a little bit more cushioning on our body. So healthy fats like olive oil, avocado, nuts and seeds are all encouraged with that balance plate. And fat, and protein and fiber are also going to make us feel fuller longer. That was a lot of conversation for one slide. I hope I didn't bore you guys too much. I tend to be very chatty. <laughs> so we wanna talk about as we age, it's interesting this process because there's so many different dynamics as we get older. We might lose a significant other, which, means that maybe we're eating alone, right? Um, we may have medications that impede our appetite. We may have a chronic condition or arthritis that makes food preparation difficult. So as we get older, we tend to eat less food and we may fall into eating patterns that may minimize variety. So lots of things can affect that as we can see. So taste changes is another one. Um, even teeth and denture issues. So whenever I do an assessment, I always ask my clients, regardless of age, how are your teeth fitting you? I mean, I have young hockey athletes that I work with. Um, they have a whole bunch of teeth knocked out already. So dentition is an issue at any age. Uh, it could be eating on a budget, uh, especially now with the pandemic, even that can pose an issue in terms of just getting out and feeling safe. Right? So there's many things that can impact uh, our access to food and our intake. So let's shift gears and we're going to talk about Okinawa, Japan. And, you know, one day I, I really hope I can get to this island. Uh, it's nestled in between it's Japan and Taiwan. And then you find Okinawa right there. And like I mentioned before, this place has been studied because we find individuals living in Okinawa to have a very good quality of life and living into their uh, 100s. So what do we know about Japan and Okinawa? So first of all, people who live here eat on average about seven servings of vegetables and fruits daily. Now I wanna qualify, what is a serving? So I don't want you guys to think that my whole fist here is one serving because that is a lot of volume. So to make it, um, I think more achievable, a serving is going to be half a cup or half of my fist. So again, if we think back to that balanced plate approach and we have half of our plate, even at lunch and supper, you know, being vegetables and fruit, we already have close to eight servings right there. 
they also consume two servings of soya products daily. Now, I think there's a lot of concern about soy. Many people associate soy with cancer. And we know that's just not true unless you've had maybe a history of hormone induced breast cancer within your family. Um, then that's a conversation that you would have with your oncologist or dietitian to see whether or not soy would be appropriate for you. But for the rest of the population, it's actually encouraged to have soy because it can help reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. And it can also protect you against cancers. There's a certain chemical in soy known as isoflavones, and that provides that protective measure against chronic conditions. So people in Okinawa, Japan, they enjoy soya milk. They enjoy tofu, edamame beans. And these are all things that we have access here in Canada. They enjoy mostly plant-based proteins as well. They eat some omega-3 fatty fish and omega-3s are well known to help reduce inflammation. And I would say the majority of people I see on a day-to-day -day basis, I would say most of them don't get in enough omega-3 and you don't have to take a supplement. You really don't. You can get it from your diet. They also have grains at every meal. So isn't that interesting? Because again, with our North American society, we're like, oh, no grains, no carbohydrate. But what we're seeing with these hot spots of longevity around the world is these groups of individuals who are living into their 100s are including carbohydrate in their diet and they're living for a longer lifespan. In Okinawa, they also limit red meat and dairy. And so this is very much um, synergistic with that Mediterranean diet. It's in line with that Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Now, other things that lend itself to longevity too. So it's not just about the nutrition. And I know that you guys know this as well. Uh, what they found in Okinawa is there's a very strong dedication to friends and family. In fact, the women there form their own tribe at an early age where they check in with each other on an ongoing basis. So there's such a strong sense of community in Japan. And every day they wake up and they live their life with purpose. So they have something that they are looking forward to, to participate in or to contribute to during the day. And I think that's so important. Um, again, when I think about my father who is in his seventies right now, uh, he, because of his cancer, he was forced to retire. Or I think my dad would still be working um, <laughs> if he could. But, you know, I definitely saw a shift in his mental health because he in some way lost some of that purpose. He wasn't, my dad is a professor, so he wasn't able to teach his students. So now he's kind of figured out other ways to live his life with purpose, but there was definitely a transition there for him. So I love this in Okinawa, Japan, they have this saying, which I try to remind myself as well. And it's Hara Hachi Boo. And it means that you want to eat your plate until you're 80% full instead of stuffing yourself. And I think again, in our society, we want to eat until we have to almost maybe you know, pop open that button and sit on the couch, right? And then relax. But I think a really important note is there's always tomorrow. There's always tomorrow to enjoy more of that food and not to stuff yourself. Um, so I think that's a really uh, important phrase for us to remember. And that also even lends itself into intuitive eating. Uh, I know with my daughter, I, I never ask her at a meal, are you full? I try and actually ask her, do you feel satisfied? And I think that means more than just, are you full? Because I think that denotes again, that, that um, feeling of just sort of stuffing yourself, right? So I would challenge you guys to ask yourself that question at your next meal, you know, like, do I feel satisfied? Can I stop at this point? And I mean, if you don't feel satisfied, absolutely eat more, but we don't want to get to that point where our, we are stuffing ourselves with 
too much energy and too much nutrition. All right, so let's talk about nuts. There was this fabulous study that took place um, in Loma Linda, California. And the, again, that's one of the other blue zones, the hotspots of longevity, where they studied uh, Seventh-day Adventists. And it was a very large group, 34,000 individuals. And they found that within this group of individuals, they had nuts five to six times a week. And that allowed them to live on average two and a half years longer. So why is that? So nuts have really um, important fats inside of them, monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, which gives us exposure, especially with the polyunsaturated fats to those omega-3, those essential fatty acids, which can help reduce inflammation. So here I go again, talking about inflammation. We also know that nuts play a role in lowering cholesterol. So some of you may know there is good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. And so that bad cholesterol is known as that LDL, that low density lipoprotein. And studies have shown that when individuals have one ounce of raw almonds on a daily basis, this can help lower that bad cholesterol, that LDL. So if you're wondering what is one ounce, that's about 23 almonds. Now, I don't expect any of you guys to just count out 23 almonds. You guys don't have time for that. A really good tip is try and just stick some nuts in your hand with your fingertips touching palm. So whatever you can kind of fit in this little nook right here, that's going to be about one ounce. So I love that little tip. Again, I got that from a dietitian, and I always pass that on to my patients and clients. So that could be an action item for you guys today. If you're not eating nuts on a regular basis is to think about having nuts on a regular basis to help with lowering inflammation and also cholesterol. Okay, so let's do a deep dive into that Mediterranean diet. So first of all, let's talk about the components of the Mediterranean diet. So the primary fat that's used is olives and olive oil. So on average, people who follow this type of meal pattern have up to five tablespoons of olive oil in a day. Now, I'm not proposing that you guys start doing that because that might be a big jump for many of you, but it could be thinking about some interesting ways of incorporating olive oil into your existing diet. I know for me, I love drizzling olive oil onto my steamed vegetables. I also love olive oil and balsamic vinegar to dip bread into as an appetizer. So, and I also, another tip here is I drizzle olive oil onto my cooked pasta and grains as well. Nuts, seeds, beans, and legumes are essential foods. So again, this goes back to those plant-based proteins that we also see in Okinawa, Japan. So cooking more with lentils, it could be making a vegetarian chili, it could be incorporating some of that tofu, it could be having more nuts and seeds, making a salad, you know, with walnuts inside of it, and then maybe even some salmon drizzled on top or sprinkled on top. Herbs and spices are used liberally. And I think especially as I mentioned, as we get older, we might experience taste changes and our appetite could be reduced as a result because food doesn't taste as palatable. So this is an opportunity for you guys to really kick it up a notch with herbs and spices. And we also know cooking with more herbs and spices can also lead to lowering inflammation. So there's lots of research coming out on things like turmeric. And I'm sure most of you have heard about that with the curcumin and turmeric helping to lower inflammation, um, information on cumin, cinnamon. So use all of those herbs and spices liberally in your diet. And this is also an opportunity for you to lessen the amount of salt that you're using. Um, for those of you who have issues with blood pressure or are maybe salt sensitive, salt can absolutely, you know, cause your blood pressure to go up. So using more of those herbs and spices can help season your food without having to rely on salt. 
fish and shellfish are an important protein source. And again, we get more exposure to some of those omega-3 fatty acids and their lean protein sources as well. And eggs are included regularly. So, you know, I remember when I was an intern again, and this was 17 years ago, we always talked about, you know, you can't have this many eggs because of cholesterol. And we now know that you can liberalize your intake of eggs. I honestly don't know anybody throughout my history of being a dietitian who would sit down and have, you know, six eggs at a meal. Okay. So if you're having six eggs throughout the week, that is perfectly fine. Even if your cholesterol is still a little bit elevated, you can still have up to six eggs in a week. That's not a problem. Eggs are such a economical source of protein that you do not. And they're also so easy to make, right? And that's one thing I love about eggs is they're just easy to make as well, that we don't want to exclude them as a protein source. The majority of grains are consumed in their whole form. So again, this diet doesn't shy away from carbohydrate, but it's encouraging people to say, hey, let's have our grains in their whole form. Let's have, you know, whole grain breads, not necessarily more processed and white breads. Let's have brown rice. Um, let's have things like quinoa. Now, some of you guys might turn your nose up at that and that's okay. I, I grew up in an East Indian household where we had like white basmati rice. And when I told my dad, well, maybe you could have quinoa with that curry. He was like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. So even if you could make 50% of the grains that you're consuming throughout the day, whole grains, I think that would be a great place to start. Moderate portions of poultry are consumed. So this would be your chicken and turkey. And so these would be leaner sources of protein. And so I promise I would talk to you about the red meat, because again, this is also something that's consumed in lower amounts in Okinawa, Japan. So within the Mediterranean style of eating, red meat is consumed less than three times per month. So very minimal amounts of that red meat. Sweets are also consumed in small amounts, so they rely more on fruits for their source of sugar. Wine is consumed often, but in moderation. So that might be good news for some of you guys who enjoy wine. Now, my suggestion here is if you don't drink alcohol, don't walk away from this presentation and start drinking alcohol because this is in this presentation. If you're not drinking alcohol, continue to abstain. And also water is going to be the primary beverage. So when we think about the Mediterranean diet, again, going back to that balanced plate approach, which I think is so simple and ties in with this Mediterranean style pattern so well, again, vegetables are at the forefront. They're going to provide us with lots of those antioxidants, and they're also going to give us volume at that meal, which lends itself to satiety or that feeling of fullness. Very similar to Okinawa, Japan, it's about eating until you're about 80% full. So those portion sizes are under control. Moderation is key. So they're not necessarily saying you can't have wine, but or alcohol or maybe even sweets, but in moderation. And very similar to Okinawa, Japan, they're not excluding other lifestyle components. So activity is so important. And when you're eating a meal, it's enjoyed in the company of others. And I think that's really hard. That's a hard one with the pandemic right now. And so I know I've, I've had a lot of book club Zoom meetings, and I know I've appreciated those get togethers once a month. And I would encourage you, if you have some friends that have access to Zoom, have a Zoom potluck dinner, or I guess it wouldn't be a potluck dinner, but just have a Zoom supper club where you guys get together, eat your supper together and have that aspect of socialization. So, in summary, with the Mediterranean diet, this is a really nice little diagram here. So those meats and sweets, so the red meat and sweets are at the very, very top of this pyramid in very small, moderate amounts. And then it's the eggs, 
cheese and poultry. And then we get a little bit bigger with fish and seafood and then olive oil. Again, the four to five tablespoons of olive oil is right, right smack dab in the middle, fruits and vegetables starting to get to the bigger part of the pyramid and finally the whole grains. So really the whole grains and fruits and vegetables make up the majority of this diet. So the Mediterranean diet and longevity. So first of all, just some background information about the Mediterranean diet. So we find this coastal cuisine in Spain, Greece, Italy, France, and Northern Africa. So what we have found, and there's so much research regarding this meal pattern, is that it reduces the risk of heart attacks, stroke, total mortality, which again lends itself to that longevity, heart failure, and disability. Now, really, the Mediterranean diet represents the gold standard in preventative medicine. I just love that. That's actually one of the reasons why I went into dietetics because I really felt nutrition was preventative medicine. And so when you hear words like that, it's like, why wouldn't I do this, right? Why wouldn't I try to incorporate aspects of this diet? The average life expectancy for people who live around this um, area is around 86 years. Okay, so moving on to the Mediterranean scorecard. So I am going to minimize this and I'm going to bring up this Mediterranean scorecard here. Okay, so we're just going to quickly go through this scorecard and the number one question is olive oil, the main source of fat used in cooking. Do you have four tablespoons of olive oil each day? Do you saute with olive oil, garlic, onion, tomato to make homemade sauce? Do you eat four servings or more of vegetables each day? Do you have three or more fruits or one and a half cups of fruit each day? Do you eat nuts three times per week? Do you have three or more servings of fish or seafood each week? Do you have three or more servings of legumes? So that could be peas, beans, or lentils each week. Do you eat chicken or turkey more often than beef, pork, hamburger, or sausage? Do you eat less than two servings of red meat or processed meat each day, including hamburger, ham, or sausage? Do you eat one tablespoon or less of butter, margarine, or cream each day? Do you eat commercial baked goods such as cookies, donuts, or cake less than two times per week? Do you have less than one can of sugar-sweetened beverages each day? And do you drink seven or more glasses of wine each week? All right, so if you guys haven't had an opportunity to go through this questionnaire, uh, you can do that and total your score and see if how many yeses you have and how many no's you have. And again, just with number 14, the disclaimer here, if you drink alcohol, drink in moderation. And I just wanna just have a quick conversation about what that moderation is. So when they're talking about wine, a serving of wine is about five ounces. So again, when you go into a restaurant or maybe even at home, if you have a big goblet, and you're like, that's my serving. That's probably closer to two, I would argue. <laughs> so five ounces of, is closer to about half a cup. And like I mentioned before, if you don't drink alcohol, please don't start. Okay. So that is the Mediterranean scorecard. So from this, you could pick one to two areas to work on. Now, the next thing that I want to go through is the heart and stroke meal planning toolkit. So this is great. Kara Rosenblum, she's one of my dietitian colleagues in Ontario. She developed this and it's such a wonderful blueprint for how you could form some of your supper meals. She gives you a grocery list. It's all laid out. And I know for me, 
supper becomes my lunch meal for the next day because I don't want to reinvent something new. So I always will, you know, make a little bit more for supper and roll that into a lunch meal for myself. Um, as I mentioned before, this meal planning toolkit, it follows the guidelines of the Mediterranean diet. So it's all laid out for you. So we'll just take a quick peek at that. So again, when we think about that Mediterranean diet, the emphasis is going to be more on those whole grains, those vegetables and fruit and those lean proteins. So if you click on the highlighted um, areas, it will bring you to that recipe. So here she has this beautiful lemon roasted halibut and asparagus. On Monday, she's planted the seed for a chickpea curry with brown basmati rice and sauteed kale. There's a beautiful broccoli lentil pasta, which she provides the recipe for a salmon, bean and orzo salad. And I have tried this one. It is wonderful. Now, some of us don't want to cook all the time. And I would argue that if you guys are living by yourself or if you have a significant partner, you could probably get away with maybe only making three supper meals and just relying on some leftovers. Um, so if there is a day where you're just like, I just don't want to cook a rotisserie chicken can be great for that. And then just cooking up some sweet potatoes and asparagus. Now, for those of you who are really wanting to be adventurous and you're like, I think I might try that tofu. She has a tofu stir fry here with bok choy and red peppers with quinoa. Now, she says, if you're not a fan of tofu, that's okay. Just use that leftover rotisserie chicken. Um, here we have week two. Um, I'm going to say this Greek lentil salad. I've tried that. That's also wonderful. Now, I don't know if many of you guys know this, but Canada is actually the number one producer of lentils in the world. So just our neighbor, um, Saskatchewan, has so many lentil farms. And if any of you guys are wanting to experience, experiment with plant-based proteins, lentils.org is such a fabulous place to get tons of lentil recipes. And you don't have to soak lentils. I think that's a big uh, deterrent for people to cook with plant-based proteins is they don't know how, and they think that they have to soak everything overnight. With lentils, you don't. And so I always encourage people to start with that legume when they're trying to experiment with plant-based proteins. Um, here she has a mango chicken salad, which is also wonderful. What I also like about this meal planning toolkit is she gives you the time. So all of these for the most part are under 30 minutes because we're heading into summer and who wants to be strapped cooking in the kitchen right now, right? And then finally week three. So again, she's planting the seed for tofu kebabs. And I would highly recommend using extra firm tofu if you guys do that. Um, here we have like a chicken and vegetable ratatouille pasta. This is a roasted trout with avocado mango salsa. And then at the end here, she just talks about that balanced plate a little bit more, a bit of a reiteration from what I discussed and shortcuts to making dinner faster. So I hope you guys really enjoy that meal planning toolkit. Okay. And then I also provided with uh, the Alberta Health Services has a great handout talking about the Mediterranean style of eating. They have a similar scorecard. It's a shorter version of the scorecard that we went through. And they also have a recipe that you can try as well. And last but not least is that salmon salad recipe. Um, I'm not sure if I brought that up. Let me just see if I did. I don't think I did on my screen, but that's okay. You guys have that. I was telling Diane and Heather earlier that I made that salmon salad recipe last night because my daughter and my husband were going out biking and we wanted to make something quick. And my daughter doesn't really like salmon. But with this salmon salad recipe, she really enjoys it. And it only takes about, I would say, eight minutes to make. Now, using canned salmon, it's economical. Um, now, the price has gone up 
um, for about 213 grams, you're, you're looking at spending close to about $4 per can, but that's going to give you about two to three servings. So that's not bad. I always encourage people to get salmon with the bones. I know that may sound a little nasty, but the bones are a rich source of calcium. And when you're chopping up celery and onions, you don't even notice, but you're getting a great source of that calcium. So I, I hope that you guys try that recipe. All right. So in conclusion, let's talk about some action items. So we talked about a wide variety of things, and we spent quite a bit of time talking about that Mediterranean diet. So an action item could be try out one of the recipes. So it could be the salmon salad recipe. It could be a recipe from Kara Rosenblum's meal planning toolkit, but try something. I think that's a great way of increasing your repertoire and also getting exposure to some of these nutrients that will lend itself to longevity and lowering inflammation. Look at that Mediterranean scorecard. Is there something on that scorecard that you marked no, that maybe you could change to a yes? And is there anything else that you guys can think that you could work on as an action item? So I'm gonna open this up for some question and answer. Um, and I'm not sure, Diane, if there's anything in the chat that maybe you wanted to uh, let me know about. Uh, no, we don't have any questions in the chat at this point. So if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and give uh, your question to Lalitha. Oh, we got a quiet group. You gave us all lots to think about and <clears throat> it was uh, really good and thorough. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, thank you all, you know, for having me come out and, and participate in this session. Please don't hesitate if you, if any of you want to reach me and maybe have a private conversation, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, you can contact me at taylornutrition.ca or I'm also on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks, Lalisa. That was, oh, you're gonna oh, cover that? Go ahead, no, I just wanted the, the little contest to make sure. You'll, you'll cover that? Go ahead. Oh, oh go ahead. Okay, Heather. so um, we've got three recipe books for people to win, but in order to win the recipe book, we want people to make Lalisa salad, the salmon salad <laughs> recipe. Um, and post the photo to our Healthy Lethbridge Facebook page, or you can send it to our Healthy Lethbridge Gmail address. So I put that in the chat box, um, and then you'll be entered to win uh, the recipe book. So that was included in um, our uh, link today for this webinar too. So you can look at the recipe book is for cooking for one to two Mediterranean diet. That's awesome. If you're not comfortable with sharing uh, pictures, even if you give it a try and just pop us a quick email and say, this was delicious or something like that, then yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So Debbie asks, what is the deadline? Hmm, I think we should keep it open till the end of the month. What do you think, Heather? I think that sounds good. Thanks. Okay, so we'll do a draw <laughs> in that last week of June there. So yeah, please give it a try. And if for some reason you didn't get the resources that Lalitha was referring to in her presentation, let us know because we tried to send those out to each of you. Um, but uh, yeah, if you didn't get them, please let us know and we'll be happy to connect those with you. Um, and just a last little bit uh, coming up next week on Wednesday, we have our first outdoor activity for Wellness Wednesday. So we hope you can join us in Elizabeth Hall lands. So that's on the west side river bottom, sort of near the bottom of the par three golf course. Um, and we're going to bring a bunch of sets of uh, Nordic poles. So if you've never tried Nordic pole walking, you can come and join us if you really don't wanna use poles, but you just would like to walk, you're also welcome to do that. We'll be meeting at 10 o'clock <clears throat> um, in the parking lot there by those Elizabeth Hall wetlands. And we will take ourselves for a nice stroll through the park and see what we can see. I'm sure there'll be some 
really nice uh, wildlife, probably some birds, we might see some turtles and see what's, what's blooming in the coolies as well. Um, so hopefully you can join us for that. We'll send some more reminders and information out for that activity. Um, and then later in June, June the 23rd, we're gonna have Steve Peterson join us and he's going to do a virtual presentation on having hope. So again, that's what's coming up in June. Um, I think that's about all I have to share. Oh, and of course, don't forget those Zumba Mondays, Movement Mondays. So the next two Mondays, you can join Sheila Mogru at 9 a.m. again on Zoom. Uh, same Zoom link we'll use for everything. Uh, get yourself moving. We're going to build up those uh, community minutes for the participation challenge and uh, keep logging those in. We'll see what we can do for Lethbridge. I think it's, it's going pretty well so far. Thanks for everybody for your time today. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us, you can drop them in the chat. Um, and again, Lalitha, thank you so much for joining us and sharing um, your, your knowledge. It was a great presentation. And I think it inspires all of us to have a look at what we're gonna have for lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. Have a thank you, lots everybody. of good comments here, thanks. Take care. Yeah. Okay, bye. Yeah, Lalitha, we had lots of people saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Gonna give things a try. Great presentation though. So thanks again for being with us today. Much appreciated. Oh, you're welcome. I hope it was meaningful. Yes, I think so. <laughs> All right, well, take care. It was really nice meeting you. Yes, you too. Have a bye. Bye-bye.